Sorry. I'm Fatima Al Anuti, and um, I'm very pleased to be here. I thank the organizers, uh, Professor uh, uh, Karas and Professor uh, Kostas, for inviting me here. And it really gives me a lot of pleasure to be here chairing the session for one of our great uh, researchers in the vitamin D, uh, Professor Grant. So he will tell us and give us a very uh, a comprehensive overview about vitamin D and um, its association in terms of deficiency with cancer. So, uh, Professor Grant, uh, I'm sure like we don't have to introduce you, like you know, you speak, the reputation speaks for itself. So, without further ado, I would like to welcome you to start your presentation. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank the organizers for inviting me. And I'd like to acknowledge I have funding from Biotech, Pharmacal. Um, a vitamin D uh, manufacturer and supplier in the United States. So I hope that this uh, presentation will convince you that there's a very important role of solar UVB exposure and vitamin D in reducing the incidence and, and mortality rates from many types of cancer. Uh, let's see. Some of them must be a down button here. Uh, Um, hmm. oh, okay. So here's the outline for this uh, presentation. Uh, first, what causes cancer? Second, a little bit ab about the mechanisms whereby vitamin D fights cancer. Uh, a list of the important cancers for Mediterranean countries. The types of evidence that are used. The evidence that exists for several types of cancer. Uh, some of the results from uh, randomized controlled trials, and finally, uh, recommendations. Uh, so what causes cancer? Well, cancer results from uncontrolled growth of cells due to DNA mutations, as well as a loss of mitochondrial function in cells. Major risk factors for cancer include smoking, uh, consumption of alcoholic beverages, pollutants in including pesticides, uh, meat-rich uh, and animal-rich diets, and obesity. And how does vitamin D uh, fight cancer? Well, the active form of vitamin D is 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. Most organs uh, convert 25-hydroxyvitamin D cal to, to, to calcitriol as needed. Uh, I think we've seen some talks this morning about how it um, enters the vitamin D receptors, uh, eventually regulating uh, gene expression. Uh, this is just a, a uh, cartoon showing the, um, uh, the, the steps that vitamin D goes through, which we've also heard this morning, and it shows that, that 125 dihydroxy vitamin D does uh, uh, regulate the um, mitochondrial RNA expression in human bladder cancer cells. Okay, so uh, the actions of vitamin D against cancer, including controlling cellular differentiation, proliferation and destruction, uh, maintaining healthy mitochondria, the energy source of cells, uh, helps maintain tight epithelial junctions. These are the cells lining the organs, uh, which is often where cancer begins, and reduces angiogenesis around the tumors and reduces metastasis. So I looked at the uh, ranking of the uh, cancer types in uh, both the MENA countries, Middle East, North and Africa, as well as European countries uh, in the Mediterranean region. And we see it's the, the cancers that are generally thought of as high uh, risk cancers, breast, lung, colorectal, uh, some stomach, prostate, lung. And down in the second rank are, are pancreatic, leukemia, uh, brain cancer, bladder cancer, kidney and ovarian. So I've, I've tried to concentrate the uh, um, results I show here for the cancers that are most important. So there are several types of evidence um, that can be used to show the role of UVB and vitamin D uh, in reducing risk of cancer. Uh, first, and the type I work with most, are the geographical ecological studies where populations are defined geographically and both the cancer uh, risk uh, rates and, and, the risk, um, and the average um, risk factors by populations are then compared geographically for different uh, populations. 
observational studies, uh, case control uh, at time of diagnosis or prospective uh, studies generally using uh, cohorts. There are the randomized control trials. There are uh, some open label troubles, tr trials, which I'll discuss, and of course the mechanisms. So the ecological studies are easy to conduct with large numbers of cases. Uh, to do them properly requires data on cancer risk modifying factors averaged by population. These have been found to work best in the middle latitude countries where there's a reasonable change in UVB doses uh, over the range that affect cancer risk. Um, turns out that these studies can fail if the UVB effects are minor compared to other uh, cancer risk modifying effects. Um, one concern is that there might be non-vitamin D UVB effects. Uh, I think this is very unlikely for cancer, and if there were, uh, the mechanisms have not been identified. In the case control studies, measurements are taken uh, near time of di di disease diagnosis. Such studies generally find the strongest correlations um, with risk modifying factors, whether it be diet or vitamin D or anything else. There is some concern that having a disease affects serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration. Uh, this has been shown this morning to be uh, important for inflammatory diseases, but I don't think that cancer results in systemic inflammation, so I don't think that's a, a factor here. Also, it turns out if you plot um, the odds ratio or the risk ratio for cancer as a function of follow-up time uh, in the study, prospective study, and you draw a line uh, through that, you'll find that the case con control studies with time equals zero are right on the line for the uh, prospective studies as a function of time. In other words, the longer the time is, the less useful 25 hydroxy vitamin D measurements at time of enrollment in the study are, and so you get a uh, reduction in the, in the uh, correlation. Prospective studies uh, just mentioned there's a problem with changes in time, and there are also changes with season, so they're, they're a little bit problematic. The clinical trials, most vitamin D clinical trials have not found beneficial effects for cancer or most other health outcomes. The main problem is that RCTs implicitly make assumptions appropriate for pharmaceutical drugs. First, that the trial is the only source of the agent and second, that there's a linear dose-response relationship. As is well known, neither of these assumptions is satisfied for vitamin D. So more recently, um, grassrootshealth.net, um, a California-based vitamin D advocacy organization, is promoting open-label trials. In these trials, enrollees may be given free vitamin D and counseled on dosage to achieve 100 to 150 nanomoles per liter as in a pregnancy study I mentioned this morning by McDonald et al. Or they may purchase vitamin D3 and choose their own dose as in a breast cancer study also by McDonald et al. in 2018. Um, the important thing here is they, they measure serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D at least every six months and they can use a mail-in finger prick blood spot assay kit which is very inexpensive, uh, around 35 to dollars in bulk, around $60 um, uh, commercial. Uh, in the grassroots health approach, they fill out health and lifestyle questionnaires at each time of the assay. And so the data can be used to determine correlation between serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration achieved and health outcomes. So go back to the history now of, of um, uh, vitamin D and cancer. The first uh, indication, the first strong indication that vitamin D might reduce the risk of cancer was a, a, uh, in a paper published by the brothers Cedric and Frank Garland in 1980. Uh, they had seen an earlier version of this map uh, which only had five scales uh, instead of 10. In this case, the uh, red indicates the highest uh, mortality rates, uh, blue indicates the lowest mortality rates. The dashed lines represent annual solar U, uh, radiation doses, and you can see there's a, a good uh, correlation between uh, the low doses in the upper uh, northeast and, and high rates of cancer versus the higher uh, solar doses and lower cancer rates in the southwest. 
Um, in my studies, I've used the solar UVB doses for July 1992, determined from uh, a NASA satellite instrument. And what you see here is a very, a very asymm asymmetrical pattern. Uh, the high UVB doses on the uh, west are, are due to the high surface elevation and the lower stratospheric ozone concentration due to the air masses cr trying to cross the Rocky Mountains and pushing the, the tropopause higher, making the ozone layer thinner. Uh, these data may not correct for clouds or for aerosols, but they do show the importance of this asymmetrical pattern. Um, now, looking at uh, data from um, uh, prospective studies, um, this is a recent paper by Garland and Angorum, they show that the, um, there's a significant uh, reduction in, in uh, colorectal cancer for high versus low 25 hydroxy vitamin D uh, in a meta-analysis. Uh, for breast cancer, you have a similar pattern, although you notice that along the west coast, there is more pink and red along the coast. Um, I think what is happening here is that first of all, women probably spend a little bit less time in the sun than men do. Uh, men often work outside, play outside, where women are more in, indoors. And then along the coast, we have more clouds and fog, um, so, so that um, uh, there's less UVB exposure there. But you have the same general uh, diagonal pattern. Unfortunately, in more recently, the year 2000-2004, that pattern has largely disappeared. And I think that's due to uh, people spending less time in the sun, use of sunscreen when in the sun, and use increased risk of other factors such as obesity and improved survival rates. Um, now, uh, personally, I like the case control studies for, for breast cancer, and this is a, a graphical meta-analysis of 11 case control studies from seven countries. And you see they overlap very, very well. Uh, and I... Th um, uh, I think that the fact that they do indicates that case control studies are a useful uh, tool. Now here is another study. This is from the Grassroots Health um, uh, study, plus the results from a, a clinical trial. And uh, while they don't have the data for below 10 nanograms per milliliter, uh, the results are very similar to those uh, from the case control study. So in this case, it's, it's uh, so the, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels are due to vitamin D supplementation, even though it's not a randomized controlled trial. And you see that when you get out to um, uh, around 70 nanograms per milliliter, the risk is much lower than at um, uh, 10 to 20 nanograms per milliliter. It goes down in almost a linear fashion. Uh, breast cancer survival uh, is also um, correlated with serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D at time of diagnosis. This is breast cancer specific uh, survival, and this is overall survival. Um, and in both cases, there's a, a large difference. Um, this is a recent study um, showing that if people with breast cancer started supplementing with, with vitamin D after diagnosis, they had um, half their mortality rate over uh, 11 years as those who did not start supplementing after diagnosis. Uh, lung cancer mortality rates, in this case I'm using the results for black males, uh, which shows a, the pattern of, of higher rates in the northeast, lower rates in the south. Uh, here's a meta-analysis showing that from observational studies, uh, higher 25 hydroxy vitamin D is related to a lower incidence rate of, of lung cancer. Uh, this shows survival uh, rates over about nine years for several types of cancer, and lung cancer does show a, an effect, as does breast cancer. I think for colon cancer and lymphoma, it's uh, more limited. Prostate cancer is sort of, uh, uh, is very problematic. Uh, as you see in this uh, slide, the high rates of, for prostate cancer in the northwest, the lowest rates are in the southeast. Uh, this, is not, uh, this doesn't uh, correlate directly with the uh, UVB. In fact, in fact, in Australia, they found that the people living in the highest UVB dose area have increased risk of, of prostate cancer. And there was a study from Finland in 2004, I believe it was, by Tuohima et al., showing a U-shaped relationship between 25-hydroxy vitamin D 
and, and prostate cancer risk. Uh, this is a meta-analysis, a graphical description, a depiction of, meta, uh, of the meta-analysis. And you see at the higher concentrations, there is an increased risk of, of prostate cancer. Uh, I think what is happening is that since calcium is a risk factor for, for prostate cancer, I think that higher 25 hydroxy vitamin D it means that more calcium is being absorbed uh, through the intestines and that then um, increases the risk of prostate cancer. However, if you look at survival, uh, increasing 25 hydroxy vitamin D does increase survival rates. That's been shown in, in a, a clinical trial by Hollis et al. Um, so there's, it's, it's, it's a bit of a concern. It's, it's people still working this one out. Uh, this does show that um, survival is better with higher 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations. Uh, bladder cancer shows the, uh, the similar um, uh, asymmetrical pattern. Um, this shows that uh, I may have the numbers reversed, but, but higher concentrations associated with lower incidence of breast cancer, or bladder cancer. Um, here's survival for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. It's better with um, uh, greater than 63 nanomoles per liter versus less than 63 nanomoles per liter. Kidney cancer uh, shows sort of the pattern, but there's higher rates of kidney cancer in the middle of the United States I think that's due to pesticides and, and from agricultural uh, use. Uh, a lot of wheat and corn and soybeans are grown in that, that region of the country. And um, the kidney has to, uh, is exposed to the pesticides. I think that's what's happening there. However, um, uh, it, there is an observational studies do show that higher 25 hydroxy vitamin D is associated with lower risk of, of kidney cancer. Ovarian cancer, again, has uh, the same uh, pattern, more or less. And a study in, in Australia shows that UVB dose is inversely correlated with, with uh, ovarian cancer. Observational studies uh, cannot, are not consistently showing that there's a, a benefit of higher 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Other vitamin D sensitive cancers identified in ecological studies include endometrial, esophageal, gallbladder, laryngeal, stomach, vulvar, leukemia, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So we have 15 to 20 types of cancer um, that uh, show an inverse correlation with UVB, and many of these also with, with 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Uh, so there have been three um, clinical trials, RCTs, that found reduced cancer incidence rates with respect to vitamin D plus calcium supplementation. The first one in 2007 uh, had three arms, calcium, calcium plus vitamin D, and uh, placebo. In the placebo arm, um, in the calcium arm, there was a non-significant reduction in, 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 in all cancer. In the vitamin D plus calcium arm, there was a very significant result, which was much stronger than the calcium alone. So the conclusion was that vitamin D did reduce the risk of cancer. Um, the, um, uh, okay, that's what I just talked about here. In the Women's Health Initiative study, um, uh, the earlier analysis of all the data showed no effect of 400 IU per day plus one gram of calcium per day. However, when the data were reanalyzed, dividing the women into two categories, one for those who are not taking calcium or vitamin D prior to enrollment, and the other, those who were, show that those who, who did not, were not, uh, they found a significantly decreased risk of total breast and breast, invasive breast cancers by 14 to 20%, and non-significantly reduced the risk of colorectal cancer by 17%. And this, uh, these results are consistent with the 25 hydroxy vitamin D breast cancer incidence uh, curve I showed earlier. So um, we have a new study uh, from Nebraska, uh, a four-year study. Um, unfortunately, the mean BMI was 30 kilograms per meter squared, which is obese. Uh, and the mean baseline 25 hydroxy vitamin was 82 nanomoles per liter. So neither of these um, values were optimal. 
The treatment group now received 2,000 IU per day of vitamin D plus 1,500 nanograms per milliliter of calcium. Um, I'd really like to have these studies performed without the calcium being given to, uh, to the treatment arm, but I didn't design the study. So uh, the, in this study, the, the, uh, the 25 hydroxyvitamin D levels increased to 110 nanomoles per liter uh, while remaining around 79 nanomoles per liter in the placebo group. Now, in the intention to treat, uh, there was one extra case in the treatment arm than in the placebo arm that would be associated with P of less than 0 0.05. So this was labeled as non-significant result. This paper is published in JAMA, and as I mentioned earlier, JAMA does not like vitamin D because Big Pharma does not like vitamin D. And, um, but it turns out that the, the uh, the uh, data were also analyzed in terms of 25 hydroxy vitamin D achieved and incidence of all cancer. And it turns out that above about 50 to 55 nanograms per milliliter, there was a significantly reduced risk of all cancer incidence compared to uh, that below around 30 or 40 nanograms uh, per milliliter. JAMA did not let them publish this in the printed version because it was not in the test Pro protocol. So they relegated it to an online supplement, which most people didn't read. And so JAMA uh, sent out a press release saying, see, vitamin D does not reduce the risk of cancer. The University of Nebraska sent out a press release, or Creighton University sent out a press release, says, yes, it does. So we had these two uh, competing press releases, making it a little difficult to decipher. So how to conduct vitamin D RCTs? First, you want to start with a serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration health outcome relationship. Then you want to measure baseline 25 hydroxy vitamin D values. If possible, recruit non replete subjects. Try to recruit people with low 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Measure serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D during the trial every so often, in part to adjust the supplemental doses and then to analyze the health outcomes with relationship to 25, achieve 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations. Robert Heaney described, discussed this in 2014. Uh, we described this again in 2018. Now there is, has been some concern about high 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations. This concern arose since a number of prospective observational studies found U-shaped 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration health outcome relationships. Unfortunately, the research did not ask participants when they started supplementing with vitamin D. As a result, many with high 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration at the time of enrollment were actually put in the wrong 25 hydroxy D category based on long-term values. And the evidence for this is as follows. If you look at frailty versus 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration for men in the United States, it's an inverse relationship. But for women, it's a U-shaped relationship. And we know that in the United States, postmenopausal women are told, start taking vitamin D. And so they, you know, perhaps they came to the doctor's office with osteoporosis and says, aha, you need vitamin D. So when they got enrolled in the frailty study, those with the high values were in the, the wrong category. So recommendations to reduce cancer risk raise serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration to 100 to 150 nanomoles per liter, or 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. That could take 2,000 to 5,000 IU per day uh, in daily or weekly doses. Recall that the half-life of 25 hydroxy vitamin D is around maybe two weeks. And in terms of pharmacology, you want to dose at something less than the half-life, maybe a quarter or, or less of the half-life. So monthly dosing is not recommended. Uh, turns out that taking magnesium helps convert vitamin D to 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And we note that one can produce 10,000 to 20,000 IU per day uh, vitamin D3 with whole body sun exposure. So 5,000 IU per day is certainly a physiological dose. Uh, there's sensible sun exposure. Uh, sun burning is not a risk factor for melanoma uh, in uh, however, people who sunburn frequently have increased their melanoma due to having pale skin. 
It turns out that pigment, either native pigment or induced by tanning, reduces risk of melanoma. And a recent paper showed that having higher 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations can redu greatly reduce the risk of sunburn or erythema by about a factor of two. Uh, turns out that vitamin D th 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 can, can also be used for cancer treatment. Uh, organs make the 125 from 25. Uh, do not use vitamin D2, it's not as effective and often shown not to be beneficial in, in trials. If chemotherapy is used, you want to monitor, monitor both 25 hydroxy vitamin D and the chemo concentrations. Uh, finally, I list these vitamin D advocacy organizations uh, in the United States and Canada and in Poland that are good size, sources of vitamin D information. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Grant, for not only giving us a very systematic and thorough comprehensive uh, review of cancer in the context of vitamin D, but also of um, sharing with us how to actually conduct rigorous and valid RCTs, because this is often, you know, what's missing uh, right. in the field. Thank you. Um, so we open the floor for questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is uh, an important uh, uh, talk uh, trying to address uh, this uh, problem that, however, until uh, we do not have very uh, well uh, conducted uh, clinical trials, I think uh, uh, that uh, will be unsolved. One of the major objections uh, to the association uh, between uh, low vitamin D and cancer is uh, derived uh, by the fact that patients with cancer generally uh, stay at home, they do not move, they are uh, badly, in, uh, they have bad nutrition. So in some way it is uh, uh, expected to have low serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D if you measure at the time that you, uh, the patients uh, have cancer. So I think this is uh, very difficult to, uh, the, uh, to overcome this problem if uh, you do not have uh, interventional studies. Uh, thank you. Uh, what I tried to show was that uh, if you look at ecological studies, observational studies, both perspective and case control, uh, intervention studies and mechanisms, you find a consistent uh, result uh, for well-designed studies that there's a beneficial effect of UVB in cancer. Thank you for your talk. Sorry, I was not from the beginning in the room, so I lose um, uh, the first, uh, present, uh, first part of the presentation. Uh, do you believe that there are only uh, lower uh, levels of vitamin D that are responsible for the increased risk factor for cancer? Or uh, a, with these low levels, uh, probably polymorphism of VDR uh, are responsible for the presentation or the association of vitamin D with cancer? Well, I think the main driver is 25 hydroxy vitamin D. I think minor effects would be the genetic effect. Uh, one thing I didn't discuss was Mendelian randomization studies. Uh, there have been about six, maybe 10 or 12, 10 or 15 um, Mendelian randomization studies looking at the genetic variations of, of the, the different uh, um, molecule, different steps in, uh, re related to 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations. And almost all of these studies have not been able to find a correlation between what they, their, their genetic factors and, and cancer. And I think is that, that the genetic factors, uh, well, first of all, they're only looking at a few percent of the genetic factors, but I think that the power of these studies is low. Um, I mean, uh, the, uh, in these ecological studies, um, there are many factors of, uh, affecting the risk of cancer. Um, in my uh, first study, it was just UVB, but in a later study, it was thrilled in alcohol, smoking, uh, urban rural residents, poverty level, 
Hispanic heritage, and these all play a role in, in um, the risk of cancer. I don't know if that quite answered your question, but. Okay, if there are no more questions, then thank you again, Professor Gunn, thank you.